Welcome to Take Cross. This is another episode of uh, Basic Christian Topics, and we're going to be talking about justification and adoption. Last week we talked about election, and this goes right in with it, with justification. And uh, this is a, a precision uh, topic. It's very precise. You have to be use words that are very precise, because if, if you get this wrong, uh, you will turn your theology into a heresy because the justification comes completely and only by God, nothing by what we do, nothing by what we say, nothing by what we uh, choose, but it is only by the justification and actions of God. And uh, just like a Rolex watch, it's very precise. Justification is a uh, a link in a chain. All these different links are chained together and just go from election to justification to, to adoption to uh, uh, sanctification to glorification. All of these chain links uh, come together. In Romans 8, 29 and 30 it says, For those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You see the chain there? There's a, a linkage that connects all these attributes from God together. It's a legal declaration. Justification is an instantaneous legal act. Uh, it happens just like a judge coming into a courtroom with his gavel and he declares, thus, it's the law. And he just whacks that little hammer down and it's done. There's nothing can be done after that. After the decision is made, it is finished. God accepts Jesus' righteousness as our righteousness. God declares us to be just and morally righteous. Now, just because we've been declared by the law to be righteous, uh, uh, you know, that doesn't make us righteous. There's going to have to be a change. So if, if you adopt a child and that child is brought into your home, uh, you have a legal document that says that child is yours and you are now part of a family. But when the child comes in the home, he's got a whole set of different way of doing things that he's not used to, he's not uh, prepared to uh, be a part of. And so there's a, there is a reality to a transformation that must take place in that child. And so God is the justifier. God is the legal uh, advocate for you. He has justified you as being righteous and he brought you into his family. But uh, you're not there yet. That's just the first part of salvation. Salvation is in three parts. First we are justified, then we are sanctified, and then finally we are glorified. And as a result of those three parts of the whole, we become a Christian. And uh, we are a Christian. We are becoming a Christian. We are finally a perfect Christian. And that's what it means to follow God. In Romans 3, 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be the, the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So who is just? Well, Jesus is just. We're not. Who is the justifier? Jesus is the justifier. We're not. Uh, you, people walk around uh, as Christians sometimes thinking, well, I'm a good person because I've accepted Jesus. No, you're not. You're not a good person. <laughs> you're never going to be a good person. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, and, you know, as long as we got sin in us, even a smidgen little bit, uh, we are evil in the sight of God. And so God has to do this salvation. He performs it. Not us.
Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've been justified by faith. As we have faith to pick up our cross, take cross, and follow him, we become justified. We are justified as a process of that sanctification. And so we are following Christ with all our heart, our mind, and our soul, if indeed we are. If we're not, then you might not be saved at all. See, it is the work of God in your heart that brings you to the place where you want to change, that you want to put down your sin, that you want to turn away from the old past. If you don't have any desire to do that, you want to continue on in your sins and say, well, I've asked Jesus to forgive me. Well, he, certainly he will. But it is by the power of the Holy Spirit within you that gives you the ability to follow him. And if you're not following him, you don't have the spirit to give you the strength to do so. So you may not be saved. James put it like this. He says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Do you see that? What he's saying is a person who is working to accomplish the will of God is showing you their works, their faith by their works. They're not working because they want to go to heaven. They're working because they believe God is going to get them to heaven. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. See, a lot of people come into church one day. They have an emotional experience. They go down to the altar. The music is playing. The, the preacher is calling, and they go down, and they see other people going down, and they want to be a part of the group. They have this emotional experience. They ask Jesus into the heart, and they declare unto themselves, I am saved. And then they don't go back to church. They don't study their Bible. They don't follow the laws of God. They're not involved in doing anything that God has called them to do. What makes them saved? They're just like the world. They continue on in their sins. There's no transformation. There's no change of want to. There's no evidence of the Holy Spirit. There's no evidence of, of works of following God. There's a problem there. Emotions do not save you. Truth saves you. Seek the truth and the truth shall set you free. Well, what is the truth? What well, Jesus is. You have to follow him. You have to build a relationship with him. You have to obey him. You have to be committed to him. And in the, the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works? When she received the messengers and sent them out another way, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So if your faith is that I've asked Jesus into my heart, your faith is in that declaration, not in Jesus. Your faith is in a, a, a time when you said, I believe in Jesus. Well, the devil believes in Jesus. Your faith is not complete until you begin to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Pick up your cross and follow him. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Do you see that? You have to be into Christ. Christ has to be into you. There is a, there is a relationship that is taking place. It's, it's not a uh, just legal jargon. There is an actual uh, thing taking place in your heart that gives you the strength to follow him. Romans 8.33 says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, and God will justify you. Before the foundation of the earth, God chose whom he will save. He said, You will be my child. And then he declares an act. He says, 
How does, how does he do? Well, he knows he's going to accept him. God is omnipotent. He is powerful in the way that he he's outside of time and space. He sees who is going to accept him, and he justifies them and gives them the Holy Spirit of promise that they would be sealed until the day of redemption. And as a result, they follow him. It's, it's because of what God is doing. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God takes your sin and puts it on Jesus, and he was the sacrificial lamb. If you believe in Jesus and turn back and go the other way, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus said, uh, whoever puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. So we are supposed to work for God and continue on following Jesus with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Justification by faith alone uh, and adoption are the two keys to this entire uh, concept of justification. Uh, in Romans 3.24, he says, We are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Well, justification and grace and faith are all a gift. It's a gift. God just gives it to you. So it is not something that you can accomplish on your own will. It is not a work of works. It is a receiving of the gift that God has given you, and as a result of the gift, you begin to work. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. No, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The very act of faith itself is a gift. God gives it to you. Uh, all right, in John 1, 12, he says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So it's a legal action. It is that that God has declared who his righteous are. And he's out there seeking each and every one of them to follow him. In Ephesians 2, 3, he says, Those not in Christ are sons of disobedience, and by nature children of wrath. So if you're not into Christ, you're not into church, you're not into the Bible, you're not into following Christ and his commandments. I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't have to go to church. No, you don't. You don't have to go to church. But to be obedient, you have to go to church. Why? Because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That means get together with other people uh, in the church that you might be able to glorify him and worship him and work together for the goodness and the greatness and the glory of God. That's what it's for. The church is for you. And if the church isn't perfect, well, go and work and help it to be perfect. But it's never going to be perfect because we're all sinners and we have to learn to forgive one another. Forgiveness of sins covers a multitude of sins. And so we just have to do that. So this idea of adoption comes from Romans 8.15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You adopt a child, and, I, you know, I have a little sister. Her name is Haley, and she was adopted into our family when she was four years old. Well, in four years, you can learn a lot of different things, and she did. She learned a lot of things, and it was difficult for her as a, a uh, uh, a member to come into our family because the way that she was doing things in the past was not the way that the family did. And to come into a new family is to learn new ways. And she struggled with with uh, uh, the idea of becoming a part of the Bell family, and it was difficult. But uh, she ultimately uh, come to, to love her family, and, and now we're all of us are getting old, and, and we love each other very much. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. Romans eight seventeen. 
Did you notice that what that said? If we are children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that picking up your cross and following Christ is going to cost you something. <laughs> See, Jesus died on the cross to sh not just to pay for our sins, but to show us the way. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is, is that when someone sins against you, you have to forgive them. That's going to hurt. What, but you don't know what they did to it. doesn't matter. doesn't matter what they did to you. I forget the guy's name. But there was a guy down in Charleston. He went into a, a black church, and, and he uh, sat down. He was a white guy, and he sat down and did Bible study with these wonderful people, and he killed them. After the study was over with, he just got up and began shooting at them and killing them. And uh, uh, I never will forget that, that the whole community of Charleston just poured out in support for that black community church. And uh, it was an awful thing. And, and many Christians just poured out their love and support for them. But, it, but the most remarkable thing was the members of that church who got on national television and forgave the murderer. <laughs> How did you do that? How do you possibly do that? You do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. You can only do that by the power of God that's within you. If God forgave us of our sins, who are we not to forgive others who sinned against us? If we can't forgive then we don't have the Spirit within us. And so you just have to look deep into your heart and ask yourself, are you really following Christ? Or have you taken up your cross? It is a, a privilege to follow Christ, but you will suffer as a result of it. Christianity is one of the most hated religions in the world. And all around the world, there are people who to this day are dying in great multitude because they stand for the name of Jesus. You will suffer as a result of following Christ, but you will live for an eternity if you follow Christ. God is good, and He is good, and ultimately that's what people have to decide. They have to work it out in their own heart, is God really good? Can a good God allow these things to happen? Yes, he can. But he allows it just for a temporary period of time. And ultimately, in the end, those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, those who will commit to following him, will be saved. And God is good as a result of that. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Romans 8, 18. Do you see that? Yes, we are going to suffer. Yes, bad things happen to uh, good people. Why do they happen to good, bad things happen to good people? Because technically, there are no good people. Technically. I mean, yes, you may be better than uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. I I'm glad you're not out there like some of the serial killers that are killing people and eating them. But, you know, it's great that you're not robbing banks or maybe you haven't ever committed adultery. But Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you committed adultery already. So it's an attitude of the heart. What Jesus is telling us is that the attitude of sin is so prominent in every person on the face of the earth that we are capable of the same atrocities that were done in Nazi Germany. All of us are. And that's why it's scary when I watch the news and I see the anger and the hatred and, and the, the uh, willingness to put certain people in a, in a group and castigating them as evil. Uh, those evil Republicans or those evil Democrats. Well, you know... What our purpose is, is Jesus Christ, is to pick up our cross and to follow him 
and loving people along the way and sharing the good news that we don't have to live that way. Justification is a act. It's a process of what God is doing in our life. And as a result, we will be a different person because of an act that God has done in our heart. If God hasn't done that act in your heart where you're willing to follow him regardless of anything, you may not be saved. I encourage you to read your Bible. Uh, go to the book of John. Just read the story. And uh, if you need more assistance, just uh, mention down in the, the comments uh, whatever question you have. I'll be glad to answer them. Whatever needs that you have, I'll be glad to pray for them. God bless you, each one.